Hello and welcome to episode 25 of The Final Whistle. I'm your host, Drew Ziegler, and I'm here with John Grant. Today, we're going to talk about the NBA and NHL finals, as well as the MLB. So, obviously, a very exciting time in the sports world. We got two championship series going on in the NBA and NHL. And first up, we're going to talk about the NBA. The finals for us right now, on this Wednesday, it's the Nuggets and Heat tied at one game apiece. And we, now we got in Miami tonight, the Heat are playing the Nuggets. So in the first game, the Nuggets defeated the Heat 104-93. to 93, And in that game, Bam Adebayo, 26 points, 13 rebounds, and 5 assists. He's obviously a big presence on defense and offense. And But he had a good game, but their shooters, Caleb Martin and Max Drews, who have been huge for them in the playoffs, combined for 3 points on 1 for 17 from the field. So that's why they lost, I think. Yeah, they just have to uh, do a better job in uh, that department. And they have to, I mean, like they saw in game one, they have to just, uh, not only that, they have to contain Joker a lot more than they were in uh, game one. Yeah. um, Also, like you said, Jokic, he had a great game, as he always does. Triple-double, 27 points, 10 rebounds, and 14 assists. He has just been amazing the whole playoffs, and I think he deserved MVP in Mm -hmm. the regular season. Yeah, I think he definitely deserved an MVP in the regular season. He should have uh, three-peated. Yeah. Um, they tend to not give it to people back-to-back-to-back, to back to back, like we saw with LeBron earlier, and they gave it to Embiid, but I think Jokic deserved it. And Jamal Murray also, who's been huge in the playoffs for him, Jokic's sidekick. Murray in that game, 26 points, 6 rebounds, and 10 assists. He's also been a great shooter, and he has been their key, despite Jokic, how he's been playing. Yeah, uh, Murray's been great, and uh, I mean, I remember he was great in the bubble, and then after the bubble, it wasn't as good, and everyone was just like, oh, yeah, what kind of, what happened to Jamal Murray? And now it's it's good to see him back and playing back uh, how he was playing in the bubble. Yeah, coming back from that torn ACL, he looks like he's built for these moments, and they could just go and win the finals now. Mm-hmm. And now into game two, the Heat snuck with the, snuck away with this one, 111 to 108. It was a great game. And in that game, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and Gabe Vincent combined for 65 points. Very well-rounded shooting game for the Heat. And Adebayo with nine rebounds and Butler with nine assists. So, obviously, a lot of players contributed in that game, and that's why the Heat won. Mm. So, also in that game, though, Max Strus and Caleb Martin had better games, both double-digit scoring, and I think that's why they won compared to the first game where they were horrible, as I said, one for 17 from the field. And to the Nuggets now, Jokic, 41 points, 11 rebounds, and four assists. He's just an animal. But when Jokic scores 40-plus in the playoffs, the Nuggets have lost every game. Is that surprising to you? Yeah, that I saw that stat earlier, and that's very surprising to me. I don't really understand how that makes sense, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's just a... Very weird stat. Yeah, say. Jokic said he doesn't have to score to, for them to win. Mm-hmm. And I think that's shown right in the first game compared to the second one. 15 more points, but they lose. So I think the key to success is for him to get those triple doubles and get those assists racked up. Mm-hmm. Jamal Murray did rack up some assists, 18 points and 10 assists, but it wasn't enough. And we'll just see ha- what happens in game three. It's obviously a huge game, mm-hmm. but it's in Miami. And we'll see if the Heat or Nuggets will pull it out. So now we're going to take a short break, and James will join me on the set to talk about the NHL Stanley Cup Final. So now we're back, and James has joined me, and we're going to talk about the NHL Stanley Cup Finals. In Game 1, very back-and-forth game, but the Knights pulled away with it. It didn't seem like it was back-and-forth with the final score being 5-2 to two from the Golden Knights on the winning side. Yeah, I mean, the Panthers hung in there. Um, the Knights were definitely the better team the entire way really showed. I think, you know, the defense for the Panthers really couldn't, you know, uh, keep up to the third period. And, I mean, I don't think Bobrovsky really looked as sharp as he had in the previous rounds. I think there were some saves, I mean, goals that he could have saved. But, I mean, the, the Knights were definitely the better team. I think they overwhelmed the Panthers. Yeah, Bobrovsky maybe with a little bit of nerves, but he's been in this situation before playing against the same team when he was on the Capitals and won the Stanley Cup. And the Panthers in that game, three different, a few different goal scorers, and the Knights, Jack Eichel, two assists, Shea Theodore with a goal and an assist, and Jonathan Marchessault with a goal, who's been playing well all playoffs. And in that game, Aiden Hill, just an amazing save. Stick save, putting his stick out, just 
hopeful that the puck will hit the stick. And that was the difference maker, I think. That set the momentum for the Knights, and that was huge for them. Yeah, that was like that was exactly like hope you save against the Knights in the finals a few years ago. I mean, it was literally the same exact thing. And yeah, I agree. That definitely set the tone. That, that really gets your confidence up from a team perspective. And now to game two, still in Vegas, just not as close. Knights win 7-2. to Seemed like they were winning the whole game. And for the night, uh, for the Panthers, two different goal scorers again. And there was a huge hit by Matthew to Chuck on Jack Eichel. Eichel said he was fine, and he said it was clean. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it was clean too. I think it just looked worse because uh, Eichel had like all of his his way in, in the front. He looked like he was tripping, but no, I, I agree with Kachuk, what Kachuk said. You know, you can't skate with your head down in the middle of the ice, or otherwise you're gonna get hit. I think it happens all the time. I mean, I think Kachuk he didn't you know he didn't jump or anything. He just lowered his shoulder. And I, I think I think you just had to make that play. I mean, they were down four nothing. You had to fire up your team somehow. So yeah, I think I definitely think it was a clean hit. Good, uh, good to see the Eichel's fine though. Yeah, I think to Chuck, he puts the passion in his team. He's obviously been huge for them in these playoffs, but it wasn't enough in that game as they lose seven to two. And the Golden Knights, Jonathan Marchessault again. He's always in the score sheet. Two goals. Brent Howden, two goals, and Aiden Hill, a 9.35 save percentage, who's also been great for them in these playoffs. Yeah, I can't believe Brent Howden, Rangers legend, two goals in the cup finals. But Marchessault, I mean, he's just nuts in the playoffs. I think he's had an underrated run because of Kachuk, you know, having his insane run. But he's had a very good uh, playoff run. And he, he's definitely the reason why Knights are just as successful as they are in these playoffs. You know, it's huge for them. I don't think they really expected him to step it up. I think they expected maybe Eichel or someone else to step it up, but it's huge for them. Yeah, the Knights were in the Stanley Cup Finals a few years back in 2018, but they lost to the Capitals, and I just don't know how they lose this one. They're going back to the Panthers now in Florida. Can the Panthers sneak out a few games there or what? I mean, they've been good. They're all playoffs. They have to win game three. I mean, I don't, they're not coming back from down 3-0, but... I, I think the only ch- I don't think they come back from down three one. I think they got to take two games, both games to really stay in the series. But I think I think the Knights will come back with, uh, come back to Vegas with at least one. I think they're gonna win the series. Yeah, I think this is just the Knights. This is this uh, series is for the Knights to lose. It's not gonna happen though. And I think the Knights are gonna win the Stanley Cup Finals after being an expansion team just a few years ago. And it's really cool to see. And I think that'll grow hockey more and show why it's just a great sport to watch. So now we're going to take a short break. And we're going to go over some big MLB news that just came out. So now we're back, and it's me and James again, and we're going to talk about the MLB. And the big headliner, Jacob deGrom, headed. He will be out for the rest of the season and possibly more with Tommy John surgery. We saw in his press conference he was brought to tears, basically, and obviously got a feel for the guy despite getting that huge contract from the Texas Rangers. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen DeGrom cry. I feel like he was always always had like a poker face on, but yeah, I think he really broke down. I think he's probably needed this for a while. I remember at the end of the 2021 season, like September, where like Sandy Alderson said that he had a partially torn UCL and then DeGrom shot it down. I think, I mean, I'm, I mean, I have no sources, but I mean, he might have been pitching through a partially torn UCL all of last year, which is nuts, but it's very unfortunate for him. And I think his Hall of Fame case, you know, is really up in jeopardy now. I mean, he could come back. You know, we saw Verlander come back from the Tommy John uh, win asylum, but, I mean, he's just had injury problems for so long now. I mean, I, I hope that, you know, he comes back to – I don't think he's going to throw 102 again, but I, ho- I just hope he comes back, you know, has his stuff again really becomes that elite pitcher because it, it, it would really suck to have one of the b- most dominant pitchers in MLB history not make it to the Hall of Fame. I think that would just be a big disappointment. And you mentioned Verlander coming back from Tommy John surgery. He's, but I think he's a different beast. Like, he's just a bigger guy. He can take it more. And Jacob deGrom, he's very skinny, but he throws so hard and his body just can't take it, especially his arm throwing, as he said, 102 miles per hour. But despite that, the Rangers playing some great baseball right now, one of the best teams in the league, and their offense was what they would hope it would be last year, signing Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon. Yeah, I mean, Corey Seager is just nuts. I mean, I think he's the best shortstop in baseball right now. And that entire offense, I think it's the best offense in the MLB. I don't really think they have any holes. I mean, they got Travis Jankowski hitting a very, being a very good hitter in that lineup. I mean, it's just nuts. I don't think they have any holes. You know, Jonah Heim 
has been really good for them. You know, a young catcher is one of the best offensive catchers in the league. I mean, Adolis Garcia uh, hitting unbelievable. I mean, that lineup's just nuts. And we knew their hitting would be good probably, but what's really been surprising, I think, is their pitching. John Gray and Nathan Avaldi have been great for them. Both signings that we thought might have not been good, older pitchers, but they've been playing great for the Texas Rangers. And now, but even a better team, the best team in the league that has been since the beginning, the Tampa Bay Rays, who seem to just always get it done. Yeah, I, th I think the Rangers are creeping up on the Rays, but I still think the Rays are the best team. I mean, the pitching is just as dominant as they were when we were talking about this in the beginning of the year. They've slowed it down a little offensively, but I mean, they're, they're still playing phenomenal baseball. So, I mean, I'm, I, I kind of expect, after their good start, I kind of expected them to slow down a little, but they're still like 30 games, 25 games over 500. So, I mean, they're well in first place. And they got their Cy Young caliber pitcher back, Tyler Glass now, who they'll obviously ease into um, action. And Kevin Cash, we know how he manages his pitchers. He doesn't let them go far. And their AL East rival, the Yankees, they have Aaron Judge, obviously just the best player in the league, you could say. And he has a very comparative season to last year when he broke the AL home run record. He's hitting 291, 19 homers, 40 RBIs, and the big set, 1,078 OPS. But he is heading to the IL with a toe injury, which could keep him out. Yeah, that's really unfortunate. I mean, he could be out maybe upwards to a month because of a cement slab in the outfield on the wall, which is just... If I were a Yankees fan, I'd be so mad right now. I mean, th that that's the worst way you could have your star player go out is because there's some, because of the offense f collapse in the outfield. I mean, it, it's it's really scary how he's he's just hitting just as well as he did last year. I think everyone expected him to regress, and he he he's on pace to have you know still a great season. Obviously, you know his injury is not going to let him you know hit 60 home runs. But I mean, a thousand OPS, and we're in June. I mean, that's just unbelievable. I did not expect this. And another guy, not 1,000 OPS maybe, but Luisa Rise hitting over 400 for the Marlins in that NL East. And they've been a great team so far, the Miami Marlins, in a playoff wild card spot right now. And they've got a young team over there, and everybody's hitting, and some pitchers are stepping up. Yeah, I mean, even though he's not hitting for power, you know, everybody loves the power numbers. I think he's one of the best hitters in the league. He's, his bat-to-ball skills is unbelievable. Hitting hitting 400 and, it's, and you're in June, I mean, that's just an accomplishment of stuff. He's not going to hit 400 the entire year, but, I mean, he, I feel like every game he, he has at least two hits, you know, three hits, four hits. I mean, he, 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 we, we saw him win the batting title last year, but he's just taking it to another level. Yeah, despite the ball even being out of the zone, he always finds a way to put it into play. And I think even in crazier stats, how much he strikes out, it's like barely anything at all. And we've said teams struggling a few episodes back, and it seems to be the same teams. Two from the NL, one from the AL, the Mets and Cardinals from the NL and the Mariners in the AL. What are your thoughts on those teams? Yeah, the Mets, I mean, after their series against the Rays and the Guardians, we thought maybe they're back, Magic's back, but, I mean, and, and then they swept the Phillies, but, I mean, getting, I mean, they're just not playing good baseball, just lost to the Braves. I mean, you, they're just not playing well at all. I mean, you can't you can't play well if you're always down and you're not pitching well. And then the offense, you know, it, it's been all right, but not nearly up to par as it should be. And then the Cardinals, I mean, they, they just can't pitch. I mean, they sent down Jordan Walker, brought him back up. I feel like Goldschmidt, he's really the only guy offensively doing anything. Arenado has been underwhelming. And then for the Mariners, I mean, they have a strikeout problem. I think I, I think that's saw a stat like four of the f top five strikeout leaders and the AL are, are Mariners hitters, which is just concerning. I mean, they, they have two, one of the two of the best pitchers in the league in George Kirby and Luis Castillo. They just can't get it done offensively, which is surprising to me. I thought they were good offensively. And it's, I mean, I picked them to make it all the way to the World Series, and it's just not looking good so far. Yeah, the Mariners seem to have a really great team on paper, but they're not getting it done in the games. And for the Mets... I don't know about Buck Showalter. He's just been, I feel like he's been terrible the whole year. He's not managing the bullpen well. He's not setting a good lineup. And I don't know why Daniel Vogelback is still on the team. He's just not a good hitter at all. And for the Reds, they've got an exciting team this year. Very young players, and they're all playing well. And they just brought up top prospect in the MLB, Ellie De La Cruz, who walked in his first at-bat, but another at-bat 
hit a ball 112 miles miles per hour. He's just the definition of a five-tool player, and his most impressive thing is how fast he can run, about 30 feet a second. Yeah, he reminds me of like O'Neal Cruz, a big guy, strong power, and he's incredibly fast, and he could th- throw the ball extremely hard across the diamond. I mean, I feel like they have the same tools, five-tool player, top prospect. You know, one game, we just got to see how he progresses the next few games, you know, see if he has that plate discipline. I feel like that's so important for prospects, how they pick up the ball. So, but, I mean, the Reds have a bright future. They they all got young players, and even though they're not a 500 yet, I mean, they, they're playing – for for their standards, really good baseball right now, and they got a bright future. I think in a couple of years they could be contending for a NL Central title. And that division's super weak, but you know that's a big accomplishment for the Reds. Yeah, only about five games back in the NL Central, and I think they're a very exciting team for years to come. Fans love these young teams who with a lot of energy, and I think that's also great for the game of baseball. So that'll do it for us on episode 25 of The Final Whistle. We'll see you next week for episode 26 for the final episode of the year.